Welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, uh, Sunday Night Edition. It's my uh, great pleasure to welcome and introduce two, uh, two outstanding speakers and educators. First is Dr. Mark Myers, who is a senior staff optometrist at the Coatesville Veterans Association Medical Center in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. He has served as a guest lecturer and adjunct clinical faculty at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salish University. Dr. Andrew Gerwood is a professor at the, at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salish University in Philadelphia. He is also attending staff in the Department of Ophthalmology at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. Drs. Myers and Gerwood have no financial interest to disclose in this topic, which will be periocular malignancies. I know that I am looking forward to this, uh, this evening. Uh, these are two really exquisite educators and uh, professionals. I know they're gonna, going to give us a great uh, evening tonight. So it's my great pleasure to welcome my close colleagues and friends, Drs. Mark Myers and Andy Gerwood. So guys, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Vanessa and everyone at the team. Uh, it's been a real pleasure being involved with you guys in the past. We're happy to be here again tonight. Uh, Andy and I put a lot of time into these types of presentations and uh, this venue uh, versus being live, we still put the same amount of energy in. We still try, try to deliver the exact same uh, quality and quantity of information that we would as if we were sitting uh, in an arena with you or in a room with you and talking uh, about this topic. Uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, there is no uh, I'm having a little trouble here getting forward. Let me just do this. There is the uh, disclaimer. Joe mentioned that. We have to officially put that up just to get that information out of the way. We have no conflicts, as Joe mentioned. And this is a topic that Andy and I literally was one of our first presentations that we put together. This is, this is a 20-year-old topic in the making. We put a, a lot of information into this and a lot of uh, time and energy. And we have built this lecture and it really has evolved in a significant way. And I think uh, one of the main reasons why it has evolved is that our role as primary eye care providers, as optometrists in America, is that we are doing a lot of primary care. And I work at a VA hospital, Andy works at a hospital as well as the school. And working in a hospital, we see a lot of patients with comorbidities. It's a very unique situation we have working in hospitals. And it really lends itself to this type of diagnosis where people come to us for primary care as well as eye care. And this is a diagnosis, the skin cancers, the periocular malignancies that has really taken off and really has fallen into our lap in my and Andy's opinion as something we could be very, very important gatekeepers and integral into the management uh, of, of skin cancers. And you see here, uh, these countries that you see uh, documented uh, are global powerhouses, they're, they're developed countries, and they're primarily countries that contain a dominant, a, a, a majority of folks that are white. And we start off with this because in order to understand the true impact that basal cells, squamous cells, sebaceous gland, and malignant melanoma have, uh, those being the primary skin cancers on the world and in economies and in healthcare, you have to understand what, what the epidemiology and the demographics and the economics are for a diagnosis like this because the numbers are so huge. Uh, let's just concentrate on the United States of America and North America here. You see every year there's over 5 million new cases of skin cancer diagnosed in the United States. It makes up over half of all new skin cancers. It's the most common form of cancer in the United States. And something to think about uh, as we take care of ourselves and we do our own primary prevention for taking care of our own health is that one in five people will develop some form, form of skin cancer at some point in their life. So we'll talk about some of the risk factors tonight and areas that we might be able to think about uh, when we consider our own health care. So you see here, just what I mentioned, some of the most common skin cancers, skin cancers. and just to consider this, five million people uh, are, there's 5 million new cases or so reported each year. And just imagine the underreporting if someone has a small lesion that uh, they don't do anything about. So the incidence over, uh, over our population in one year 
it's reported at 5.4 million based on numbers of Medicare claims, but it's probably more than that because people just don't report. Even primary care provi providers don't report because the clinical insignificance of a small lesion, that it do doesn't have any mortality, doesn't have any morbidity. It's kind of like us reporting cataracts. You see statistics that a certain percentage of people who are 70 have cataracts, but we know virtually everyone who's 70 has a cataract. It's just not a visually significant cataract. Same you might think about with skin cancers. And, and the number is 8,500 diagnosed every day. So these are pretty uh, impressive numbers. And here we go with the economic burden. The, the, the dollar amount is phenomenal. You have a handout in, that says the amount of the United States you see here, 77 billion. I actually just updated that slide because I found a updated uh, uh, economic uh, report from 2012. Now that's an old slot, that's an old report, but it's hard to get updated information when it comes to economics because a lot of, a, a lot of uh, uh, publications don't focus on that. So it's hard to get up to the minute data when it comes to economics on certain diagnoses, but you can see the colossal amount of money that's spent just managing skin cancer in our country just because of the huge number of cases. So we can't ignore the impact that we have on managing these cases. Our goal tonight isn't to make you a dermatologist. We just want you to sort of have an idea of what to look for so that while you're looking at a patient, whether the problems on their ear, their neck, the top of their head, or even something you noticed on the arm, you're able to say, let me make an educated guess about this and whether or not you should see somebody. Let me just tell you a few facts about the skin. The skin is the largest organ in your body. It's actually eight to 12 square feet, depending on how big you are or small you are. It's two to three millimeters thick, but it protects you from poison. It regulates your temperature. It makes sure that you have feeling and proprioception. It absorbs UVB light so that you can make vitamin D. Remember, a vitamin is something that you have to take in from your eating and that you need as a coenzyme to do something in your body that keeps you alive. And so if you're not out there in the sun and absorbing sunlight through your skin, you have a hard time making vitamin D unless you're taking vitamin D supplements. And so your skin performs these functions. And uh, even though it's only two to three millimeters thick, there are over eight layers. And so there's the epidermis, which has five layers. There's the dermis that has two to three layers. And then there's a subcutaneous fat layer. And so all of these things are impacted by the sun. The biggest issue is while you need sunlight to manufacture vitamin D and the skin does all these sorts of things, when you have a, a absorption of vitamin of UVB, which you do to make the vitamin D, it also can change DNA and that's what spawns skin cancer. What you see in front of you are the high risk factors for skin cancer and I'll go over them one at a time. I'm just curious, Joe, can you see my pointer moving around? Yes. Excellent. So the number one risk factor is how much time you spend in the sun in an unprotected way. And so when you're out in the sun, it's, it's a good idea for you to put on some sort of sunscreen to protect yourself from overexposure to these UV uh, light rays, which can mutate DNA and cause the DNA then to do something with that cell that causes a problem. Remember, a malignancy is when you have a whole bunch of cells that become dysplastic after becoming metaplastic. They, they start to change. They're not a malignancy. They become dysplastic and they become malignant when they no longer do what that main organ was intended to do. So just to give you a quick example, if you had a, a liver tumor, you would have all these cells that were no longer doing liver living. And so it's very hard, by the way, to be funny over the internet. I have learned that, but I keep trying. And so when the liver then fails, uh, or if this cancer, because it loves blood and blood supply, moves to another area of your body, preventing other organs from working, that's how you die in cancer. You die from multi-organ failure when your cells no longer do what they were supposed to for that organ, and the growth becomes uncontrollable. And so what I'm trying to tell you is this is a preventable thing. It's something where you could get advice. Mark mentioned gatekeeper. You see all these people as a primary care provider and you could instruct them. Uh, exposure to the sun can give you higher risk and be careful. You can't prevent this one. This is aging. 
And so just as we get older and the abilities of our genetics to regenerate cells uh, become smaller, then there's also increased risk that something could go wrong. Down here in this corner is family history. You are in increased uh, risk of skin cancer. Someone in your family had skin cancer. I have had skin cancer twice. Right on this cheek, I don't want to get up in the camera, um, but usually I walk around the, excuse me, the audience. But right here, I had a basal cell carcinoma that was excised, and it actually came back and turned into squamous cell carcinoma, was excised again. And so I just want to let you know, nobody in my family has skin cancer, uh, but the reason I went to the dermatologist in the first place was twofold. One, uh, my dad had all this stuff cut off of him uh, when he went to the dermatologist, said, son, you better go to the dermatologist. And two, I had a sore that was non-healing. And so that's an, another very important sign. If you see somebody with a non-healing sore, that should be checked out. You have high risk of winding up with some problem in your iris on the lower portion. And that is because the brow is protective. And there are shields criterion for whether or not you can see a malignancy on the iris. One, increased clock hours of size. Two, very young for getting that uh, darkened area on the iris. Three, visible vascular supply. Four, whether or not there is any indication of hyphema or microhyphema. And five, change in size, shape, color, or elevation, usually, by the way, on the bottom part of the iris. You can absolutely warn people to prevent this risk factor. So smoking, of anything, can lead to higher risk of, a, of skin cancer of any sort. Also, there are things that are protective, and the darker you are, the more protected you are against having sun poisoning. Uh, bouts of sun poisoning can increase your risk of skin cancer. So even if you uh, take proper precautions of wearing the right clothes or getting in or out of the sun, if you get sunburned and you're sunburned frequently, so you're a skier or you're a fisherman or you do a lot of running, et cetera, a golfer perhaps, a target shooter, any of those things where you get any increased burn, skin burns, you're at higher risk. And then there's a few other things down here that actually lower your immune system. This is human papillomavirus. This is exposure to radiation. This is exposure to chemotherapy. And this is exposure to radiant heat. Any of those things that disfigure the skin also can increase your risk of skin cancer. Some of these are preventable, and since you're a primary care provider, you'll be able to give appropriate advice. So Andy pointed out some of these extra risk factors that I, I just want to touch and just kind of expand on a little bit. The human papillomavirus has been associated with basal cell carcinoma. I, I guess it's almost safe to say the human papillomavirus is, is common enough that we now have vaccines to, pre to prevent. Uh, if you have a young uh, adolescent, uh, a teen, whether it's a boy or a girl, uh, it's strongly advocated that primary care providers are advocating that they get the vaccine uh, to prevent HPV infections uh, that cause deaths every year in our country due to sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, radiant, radiation treatments, oftentimes if someone gets high dose radiations to localize areas of the skin, you might think uh, in cases of breast cancer, for example, they deliver a high degree of radiation and oftentimes women or men who have breast cancer, they get these radiation burns of the skin, which will disfigure the skin, much like you see here in this thermal burn. When you have reorganization of the skin due to trauma, it definitely decreases the skin's natural uh, ability to defend itself. Just like with aging, when we have uh, aged skin, it loses its elasticity. And that absolutely changes the skin's ability to defend against the external environment. And then as Andy mentioned, this, this uh, graphic here with immune suppression, we're gonna talk about planned immune suppression and acquired immune suppression, such as in HIV, how when, these, uh, when the immune system is suppressed, it still has an impact not only on organs and other systems, but as Andy mentioned, the, long, the largest system of the body, that being the skin. So people are not exempt. Uh, Something else that I think is really interesting to talk about while we're talking about risk factors 
Andy mentioned UVA, UVB exposure. Well, there was a trend in the United States of America that I do not believe is as strong, the tanning bed trend, where you see here in 2009, World Health Organization declared tanning beds as carcinogenic. You see here a map of the United States of America where some states you have to be of certain age, some, pay, some states you have to have a parent, some states you, you can't even get a, 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 be admitted, admit, admitted to a tanning bed and get uh, artificial tans uh, below a certain age, regardless of parents approving it or not. So this has definitely changed a, a trend, particularly with malignant melanoma, when people are getting this intense exposure to UV light over a brief period of time. And you see some of the ways around that uh, where artificial spray tans and, and creams are used in lieu of going to a tanning bed. You know, we always hear about it during prom where girls wanna go and they wanna get nice and tan before they go to the prom. Well, those days fortunately are few and far between, not as frequent uh, as it was in the past. Who is, who is this person? <laughs> Do you know who that is? Uh, I don't. That's Tan Mom from the Howard Stern Show. So she was a woman in New Jersey. That's a white lady. She used to take, she made the news because she got arrested because she was taking her teenage or young uh, da daughter with her to get tan. And it came out that she was like a tabloid phenomenon. That's tan mom. Okay. That's, that's pretty So, that's so pretty that deep. woman that's got, pretty got deep tan. That, that's, that's a deep all over kind of tan, man. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she does not smell like tropical blend. So what, what is the reason for increased incidence? Well, you know, we're living longer. And Andy's going to talk in a minute about uh, the ABCDEs. And also, we're seeing people and we're doing more efficient biopsies. So we're detecting cancers uh, earlier, just like we want to do with all diagnoses across the, boards in, uh, across the board in healthcare, where early diagnosis, better treatments, better survival. You know, what we're talking about in many cases tonight is not necessarily mortality but morbidity, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping to preserve the sensitive skin around the eye where if we alter the skin around the eye and we mess up the, the lid globe congruity and the function of the lids because we have, for instance, a band scar or a cicatricial scar, and now you have a lid that doesn't close properly, it, it can evolve into a cornea problem and evolve into a refractive error problem and evolve into reduced vision for the persons for the rest of their life, aside from being at risk of causing permanent uh, damage other places on the face and the aesthetic problem, and also the risk of life lost. So here you just see a case where we use this tool, just like we see that's actually a PD roll. We're measuring the size of a lesion, and he's gonna talk about that in a minute. And this is an interesting case. This is actually one of our, pa this is one of my patients. This is a, one of our nurses, uh, fathers, he came in to see us. We had this lesion that I didn't like. We sent it to have it biopsied. Oh, it was biopsied for sure. That's a full thickness biopsy. And you see here, uh, it actually went under Mohs micrographic surgical technique that we'll talk about tonight. Here's that large scar. And because of early intervention, this, this scar doesn't look all that bad. And he doesn't have significant changes in his lid. And, you know, over the course of time, that looks even better from two years ago. So Andy's going to take over here and he's gonna introduce those primary skin cancers and talk about other risks. So primary skin cancer means that the cancer started actually in your skin, as opposed to like a secondary lesion. My mom died actually of pancre uh, pancreatic cancer, and they think that the place where she got that from was breast cancer, which she had. And so that would be a secondary lesion. The primary lesion was in the breast. It's primary skin cancer, it starts in the skin. And so generally speaking, you actually have uh, three stages that occur. You have metaplasia, you have dysplasia, and then you have aplasia, and all of those things lead to malignancy. And so malignancy is when there's non-normalcy, and you have non-normalcy that's multiplying. And so the way that you can see that on the skin, actually, is by using the ABCDE rule. A, is there any asymmetry? So is there anything that looks actually peculiar uh, where instead of the lesion being where you could fold it one over top of the other like this, it, it's so asymmetric that it wouldn't work that way. How about we and do so, this? You're, yes. you're, you're, you're three slides ahead, but go ahead. Okay, I thought that's what you wanted me to do. Well, how about you just, then, let's introduce this. Oh, you want me to talk about these yeah, uh, carcinomas? Talk about those. Okay, I can talk about that. I can, do, I can do that. Just so, introduce them. 
Okay, so the most common skin cancer is basal cell carcinoma. Let me just talk about this word, carcinoma. Carcinoma means a cancer non-normalcy where you actually have cells that are non-normal and cells that are abnormally growing and cells that are abnormally developing in the epithelial linings. That's what carcinoma means. So maybe if you think back in your minute, uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your mind, you might've heard of the, the word sarcoma. That's those things in connective tissue. You might've heard of multiple myeloma. That's those things in the blood. So here you can see basal cell carcinoma, carcinoma, and then of course, melanoma in the pigmentation. The most common skin cancer by far is basal cell carcinoma. So it's, I'm going to ballpark it at 80%. These all actually become a lot lower, but they're a lot more deadly. This one hardly ever kills you, even when it's really bad. And we have some slides that'll show you some pretty bad stuff. And so these, even if you get one occurrence and it's very, very small, still have high mortality. So uh, that's what I want to let you know. And I also wanna sort of say, during this presentation, we'll have slides that show you things that don't look <coughs> bad and they're not bad. We'll actually show you some things that don't look bad and they're deadly. And so it's very important that you as the gatekeeper, when you see one of these things, ask the question and give the advice. Was that good? That was great. Excellent. So yeah, uh, Andy, started to go into I hate the, being in the shop the ABCDE rules but you don't want to talk about the ABCDE rule without having uh, the diagrams to go along with it so Andy outlined perfectly what we're talking about the only thing I would add to that is the primary skin malignancies Andy talked about primary and secondary skin cancers if you looked up a skin cancers th there's dozens and dozens uh, uh, the best example that I could think of that's most commonly discussed as a secondary skin cancers cancer would be Kaposi sarcoma People with HIV or AIDS uh, could get Kaposi sarcoma as a secondary uh, development from being immune compromised, okay? But we're not gonna talk about that tonight. We're just gonna stick to the primary skin malignancies. And, and here you see, the, the and there was a diagram there as Andy outlined the skin. The sebaceous cell carcinoma, it's a little bit different because we have sebaceous glands that are most dense around the eye and that's why we're gonna discuss them tonight. Interestingly enough, if you went to a dermatology lecture, more than likely, they would focus on basal cell squamous cell and malignant melanoma. And, and sebaceous cell would come up at some point, but since we are concentrating around the eye, sebaceous cells are very densely uh, found in the upper lid and the upper brow. So we get to our first polling question. I'll just read it just to get people going. Oh, there it is. So if people want to kind of contribute there and and Mark, I'm not sure you said you weren't going to watch the chat box, but there is a question in the chat okay, box. I'll tell you what, while you, while you folks are reading that question, let's go up there and it says more and here's the chat. Any stats on vitamin D levels and incidence of cancer, including skin cancer? You know, uh, Peter. Let, can I comment on that? Just please just, do. Just please do. Bit. Uh, yeah. One of the things in my research that I read is that vitamin D is tremendous in helping you in multiple organs in your body. You can only make vitamin D uh, by either taking it in in your diet, taking it in in supplements or through sunlight. And those are the only three ways. And all of that reading didn't say that you necessarily could take in more vitamin D than you were supposed to. And that usually vitamin D supplementation is helpful for helping multiple organs. And so uh, I, I don't take in vitamin D, but you get vitamin D from the same sources where you get calcium, which is milk and bananas and fruits. Um, and also from some time in the, in the sun. And it has been noted that if you do spend any time in the sun, you'll probably have rather no normal vitamin D levels, but to supplement with vitamin D is actually helpful uh, in these areas. Can Perfect. I answer that question? Yes, yes. Uh, the, only th the only thing I will add is that if you look at the research on vitamin D recommendations, it's, it's not very crystal clear what is an adequate amount of vitamin D that you would take as a supplement. There was a big push at the VA where every senior that came in, which is a lot of people, uh, was tested for vitamin D levels. And at one point, our primary care doctors were vitamin, were writing vitamin D for three out of four patients. I could tell you that 
all you need to do is to get an adequate amount of vitamin D is pretty much get 30 minutes of sunshine a day, 30 minutes. And that doesn't mean at the peak sunshine, that's at most critical risk of developing skin cancer. You could take a walk after dinner, you know, during daylight savings where it's not dark at five o'clock like it is up here in Pennsylvania, or you take a walk in the morning. Bet outside of those critical 10.30 to 2.30 times where the sun is at its most intense, all you need is that little bit of sunshine to get an adequate amount to get the needed vitamin D that your body needs without overexposing your skin and putting it at risk. There's also vitamin D fortified milk. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a debate that goes on over and over again, the dermatology and the plastic surgery uh, and, and the oncology folks are, are vying to get people's attention to stay out of the sun with overexposure, but general practitioners, uh, vitamin folks, you know, people who are really into supplements are pushing to allow, uh, to get as much sun exposure as you can and get your vitamin D the natural way versus a supplement way. So it's something to think about. Another question. Okay, just, just to, before we go to another question, uh, the answer, the dominant answer was correct. Hypoglycemia is not a known risk factor for developing skin cancer. That was very good from our folks attending tonight. Excellent job. We have a couple more uh, questions it looks like, and we don't mind answer, uh, addressing these questions as it comes along. So how much skin needs to be exposed to get the dosage? I, I don't know that. I don't know that. Um, I, I will say this in one of the readings that I read, adequate levels were uh, measured in people who were runners who just didn't wear hats and they exposed the top of their head. So I don't know that you have to have that much of your skin exposed to actually get it. So you, you figure if you're running, even if you're all covered, hands, maybe wrists, uh, and face and head uh, might get exposed, ears, etc. And that, in that paper, that was uh, enough to get the proper vitamin D levels. That was a really good question. I'm glad. Hey, Mark and Andy, I'm going to weigh in here real quick um, regarding this vitamin D. I've been taking a, took about three or four years ago about, you know, what we can do with supplements that's out there. And as we know, vitamin D is an antioxidant. But I think one of the things that we do a lot as optometrists is we want to try and do monotherapy on a lot of our patients. You know, will vitamin D, should I just take vitamin D? And vitamin D became big, Mark, as you said, because people can measure it now. We can see levels are low and there's so, so many benefits to having vitamin D. But if you're going to try and do this regarding, you know, skin cancer and protection, it goes way beyond vitamin D. You're going to need to have to have all the antioxidants, all the carotenoids that are out there, all the polyphenols and flavonoids. So yes, I would say that the answer is, is that, you know, vitamin D is just part of that team. But if you think that you're just going to take vitamin D and prevent skin cancer, I'd probably caution away from that to the person that asked. Um, that, thank you for those comments, Greg. Not only do I agree with you, but I don't think either of us said that. <laughs> we were talking about you get vitamin D from your skin and that you can also get UV exposure to your skin, which could be bad. Mm -hmm. But uh, you need to sort of get vitamin D, and there's only three ways to get it. We completely agree with everything you just said. Yeah, yeah. I'm just answering a question. Yep. Uh, did you see another question? There? So Peter just made, uh, someone made mention about if you wear sunscreen, it is a barrier between the sun uh, and absorption, for sure. And, and the way sun SPF works, you have to have a longer exposure time. Uh, for, for the sun to be absorbed into your system and cause toxic injury. So yeah, there, there is something to be said about protection. Uh, and, and Andy mentioned also that, you know, it, it, let's face it, SPF is, is a protective barrier, just like a jacket would be, right? So, and that where, that's where the question evolved uh, just a second ago about how much skin needs to be exposed. So, so good stuff. Andy, you want to take over from here and talk yeah, about the I, ABCD rule? Yeah, I won't, I won't belabor this at all. The ABCD e rule, I think we, you can see it there sort of in, uh, it's in tan or whatever, and we'll just uh, darken it. Asymmetry, I already went over that one. Border irregularity. So even if it's something that can be folded over, if the border is undulated, then that uh, lesion is suspicious. The darker the color, uh, blacks, and very dark browns, um, and also multiple colors uh, are also suspicious. 
when the diameter cannot be covered up by a pencil. So a pencil eraser, which you'll see right here, is about four to six millimeters. And if you lay it on there and you can't cover up that lesion, it's bigger than four to six millimeters, that because of size alone, that makes it suspicious. And finally, anything that's either non-healing or anything that has elevation to it and is firm and not soft. Also, if it's firm, not soft, and it's not mobile, you can't move it around, uh, that is also suspicious. I thought I saw another question. Yep, okay, so let's keep moving here. It, these questions are popping up. That's good. Two. That's, that's a good thing. Let's see if they're just comments or their questions. Someone had a question about looking for um, the handouts, and I guess they're coming up. Does it matter the type of vitamin D? D1, D2, D3? Uh, I didn't see that in my research, but all the vitamin D that I take, and uh, I'm just on vitamin D, as Greg mentioned, because my doctor thought it was a good idea, not because I'm trying to prevent skin cancer by taking vitamin D. I just Vitamin D does a lot of good stuff all over your body, um, but it's vitamin D3 is what I take, and I've never taken the other two. Okay. Go ahead. So someone here, Valerie, is talking about specifics with UV from the sun and, and angles of the sun and UV greater than three and time of day. Uh, so, so I guess what we need to do, <laughs> it, it's a delicate balance for certain. So that's, Valerie's talking about some specifics with where you are uh, from your relation to the equator, the way she's talking about up here in the Northeast. And there's debate about the amount of exposure you get but the bottom line is it's a delicate balance between how long you're out in the sun and getting an adequate amount. And if I'm not mistaken, you don't need actually 30 minutes a day. It's like 30 minutes, maybe three or four times a day. And this is a point that's interesting. I, I don't think, I, I think it's kind of a point that we shouldn't belabor when, it, when we're talking about this because we have to use good judgment just like everything else. Everything in moderation is, not, is my motto with my patients. And the same is true when it comes to sun exposure. So not to belabor the point, but I think that's pretty much that's pretty much a good way to think about this. Okay, folks, uh, let's move on. So here's another question. Coming up here shortly, Mark. Oh, I've been sharing that one and let's put this one. So someone did ask about the handout, just as a reminder, it is, I just launched it. Thank you for the reminder. Um, I launched it at 735. It's in the chat box. It can be downloaded. And as a reminder, it was in the 645 email as a downloadable link. So this question is, all of the following characteristics of the lesion are included in the A, B, C, D, in parentheses, and E rule except. And the it's been launched. We have people weighing in. And I think we're getting to a pretty good number here that we could end the poll in about a second. So I'm gonna end it right now, everyone. And I'm gonna share the results. And Mark and Andy, you should be able to see those results. Awesome, perfect, yep, benign. That's not the one. Benign is the B that should be there is border. So asymmetry, color, diameter, and borders, it should be not benign. So there you have it, folks. And remember, E stands for elevation. Yes. So let's get to the first primary skin cancer that we're going to talk about. It's, as Andy mentioned a little bit, it's the most prevalent. And let's talk about some of the prevalence. So basal cell carcinoma, as, I'm not going to read the slide to you. I'm just going to tell you the clinical stuff. The clinical stuff is this uh, skin cancer is not painful. It typically occurs on the head and neck. You can get it also on the limbs. It's rare on the trunk. And it usually looks like a volcano where you have this area here that is excoriated, usually a non-healing sore. This is sort of what mine looked like. And I thought that I was getting this because when I shave, I was just cutting my skin there. And so I would put polysporin or some neosporin on there and it would get better. But inevitably, it would look terrible. And finally, I went to the dermatologist and she said, yeah, let me just take a sample of that. And wasn't I surprised that it was basal cell carcinoma. And so it was removed uh, with a Mohs micrographic technique. So uh, very interesting. And so typically, these uh, have pearly edges. So you can see sort of like a pearly edge to this. And uh, 
even though these are the most common type of skin cancer, they rarely kill you because they don't typically invade other tissues and go deep. Now, they can go lateral. Lateral is called the morpheiform, and we actually have a picture of one of those for you. But still, because they don't latch onto nerves or vessels, they typically don't penetrate deep, and the rate and the cause of death from this is actually very, very rare. Basal cell carcinoma. So Andy made some great points there. I just want to talk about one more thing, you know, the slow development of this, and that's where the rate of metastases really has an impact. Interestingly enough, within the last 48 hours, I got a message via Medscape. And if you get the email blast from Medscape, you're inundated with those recently because of the pandemic and every other stuff. But I just happened to get a message from, from, uh, from Medscape that there was the journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association Dermatology section at a publication on September 20th uh, from Chen and coworkers about what happens if you watch and wait to see what happens with basal cell carcinoma cases. They looked at hundreds of basal cell carcinoma cases and they've seen that if people are older or people are frail, you could just forego an urgent surgery. And oftentimes it's not necessarily overly urgent, but a surgery and just wait to see what happens to see if the rate of the basal cell grows at, to a certain degree. And if there's any, uh, essentially any mor morbidity uh, with that, with the lid function, for example. So it's going to be considered something to, to think about from a surgeon standpoint, again, going back to the cost of doing this business, uh, if it's okay just to watch these. Now, my concern is, is that if it's not basal cell and if you don't biopsy it, you're assuming uh, that it's basal cell because of the frequency of basal cell, or if someone has a disfiguring presentation, you know, the aesthetics of waiting. Uh, but we'll see if there happens to be any change in standards of care. Uh, but that literally just came out in the last two weeks. We have a couple more questions in the chat. We'll just get to them right away. Peter, caution, if taking between 5,000 or more, add vitamin K, yes. So it's talking about adding other supplements if you're taking too much vitamin D. And it's a vitamin D daily dosage. I, I forget what it is, but I remember when I took it, I was taking three pills a day. I was taking a thousand units. A thousand and I, I want to add to Peter's mm -hmm. comment. Even when I suggest that patients should take any of the vitamins, even for AMD, as Greg has suggested with all the carotenoids, I always make sure I give some sort of caveat that says, make sure you check with your doctor before you start these so that the vitamin wouldn't accidentally collide with some medicine that you're taking. So again, I, I, again I'm sort of taking the cautious approach where I might make a recommendation for general health, but I wouldn't just say, yeah, it's safe to take this and don't tell anybody, that's a mistake. So one of the things, I'm gonna change the slide and this, this slide was meant to do a couple things. Uh, this is an interesting something to consider is that, you know, when we have people in our chair, people see primary care every year, people see their dentist every six months, hopefully to get their teeth clean. People see us hopefully once a year. And like I said, we should be gatekeepers. We should be looking at the head and neck, uh, preferably. I don't go south of the neck uh, most of the time, uh, other than arms. I don't do anything more uh, substantial than that. But just by when you sit a patient in the chair, as you see here, this is a guy from this week. I added this slide this week. Uh, so this presentation, this guy was sitting in a chair and I was moving the four up there in place. I said, what's that on the back of your head and behind your ear? I said, did you cut that? He's like, nope, that's been there for over a year. It's non-healing. So the point being, Andy mentioned non-healing lesions. Common things get better with common treatment. So if you have a lesion like this, larger than six millimeters, central area of ulceration, raised pearly telangiectetic borders, that's obviously an alarm. It's not getting better, doesn't hurt. Unsightly, his wife says to him, go get that looked at, go get it looked at. Oh, it's not bothering me if you think behind my ear, nobody can see it. Well, I saw it and he's going to the dermatologist to have a skin, skin consult. The other thing that's critical to understand is that folks that have one skin cancer, 40% of the time they'll have a second skin cancer. So when you see something, you gotta look more. And that's where you see this picture here. This was a first time patient I saw earlier this year and he had this large uh, sessile uh, nevus you see here under his mask. And sure enough, I said, you know, you're looking like you're fogging up your glasses. How about we move your mask out of the way? And that's what he exposed. He wasn't even gonna bring up 
that he had this large lesion that has been growing over years. He wasn't even going to tell me about it unless I pulled his mask down. That's basal cell carcinoma until proven otherwise. So he was sent to dermatology as well. So do your due diligence, inspect the skin, take the time. It takes a let, minute to let, do. Let me just butt in just for a second. That was really good. This, this by the way, um, this is a nodule. When it's smaller and mobile and soft, it's called a papule. This is more like a nodule. And you can see there's some telangic cases. Mark used the word sessile. Sessile means broad-based. So you can touch these things to see how they perform when you touch them. If it's hard and dried, the word for that is indurated. And then if it's non-healing like this, that word is ulcerated. And so uh, just uh, important, uh, if it's on a stalk, uh, some people call that pedunculated, pedunculated. So just so you have all of the vocabulary uh, at, at your disposal. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine actually had something like this over here. And what it looked like was he got cut and the skin healed in a funny way. And I kept telling him, you need to go see the dermatologist. And he finally listened to me. It turned out to be squamous cell carcinoma. So I'm just saying some things look rather innocuous when it comes to skin. Let a skin expert look at it, make the suggestion. Absolutely. Good stuff. Good stuff. So yeah, this, these are cases that uh, I photo document these all the time. And at the VA, I could put them into the chart and I have ways to do that. And as for practice management's sake, you could be doing this. You could be doing anterior segment photography or external photography and, and documenting and coding. And as long as this makes its way into a chart, it's billable. It's completely billable. I take all these with my iPhone. Uh, so it, it's, there's, it, it's great pictures and I can mag up as much as I want. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the forms of basal cell carcinoma. Andy mentioned that the propensity of basal cell carcinoma happens above the head and neck. And the most common form of basal cell carcinoma we'll see is nodular ulcerative. So here you have a classic along the uh, lid margin, elevated, pearly telangiectetic borders, central layer of ulceration, and materosis. So here's something that, is in, that enters the conversation where versus something that we might see like a chalazion or a hordeolum or even a papule. Oftentimes benign lesions do not have associated with them something that suggests uh, um, longstanding uh, chronicity or, or some debilitating effect by losing lashes. When you see lashes lost in an area, that's a major indicator of suspicion that the patient needs to have that looked at. So that's a classic uh, elevated lesion that's nodular or ulcerative form. This is another type of presentation where you have actually two things going on separately. This is one that's really problematic because of its location in the medial canthus and its location to the uh, lacrimal drainage system, where you do not want just some general surgeon or even a plastic surgeon. Uh, I would want an oculoplastic surgeon for sure tackling this one, giving its location. But what's very uncomfortable about this picture is that I'm going to trace this area where you could see a modification in the skin. This is a different form of basal cell carcinoma. This is called the morpheiform uh, type of basal cell carcinoma. And this is a broad base excision area uh, that is really complicated. So this was a complicated case for two reasons. Here's another example. Oh, sorry. Where a classic case, again, someone comes in and they have their nose pads in the way and just the chronic tension that the weight of his glasses had was just causing a modification in the skin and it caused that presentation. And when that was sent uh, to plastics, that was actually a basal cell carcinoma. Again, nodular ulcerative, it's not quite ulcerated at this point, uh, but that was a case there. Go ahead, buddy. Well, the only thing I wanna say, and I think all of you realize this, I'm chicken to the doctor, I just will say. And if I think that this thing is just because my, the nose pads of my glasses are causing it, of course, I'm not gonna, seek care from a dermatologist. And so that's, that's where a primary care optometrist might make the suggestion, get the ball rolling to give people information so that this actually gets uncovered. You see something that there's one more something in the chat. Anything on the face? Oh, needs, yeah. <laughs> anything on the face needs to be excised by an oculoplastic 
or at least a skilled plastic surgeon. I've had patients butchered by dermatologists who don't know the limitations of facial skin. I agree with that. Yeah. In fact, my dermatologist never ever uh, excised anything off me unless it was just the initial punch biopsy. All the rest of the stuff was done in oculoplastic surgeon with Mo that had gone to Moe's College. We absolutely agree with that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just make a comment, and it's no way a knock on certain subspecialties, but I have to tell you that where I am, I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, the medical community is exploding, and these doctors can't keep up, so what do they do? They hire nurse practitioners and physician assistants, and many times the dermatology practices in particular, I don't want to sound like I'm picking on derm or picking on PAs or picking on NPs, but I'll tell you that it takes six months in Lancaster, Pennsylvania to get into a dermatologist office to see the doctor. So many times people are going in because we are sending them in and guess what? They're seeing an NP or a, or an, or a physician assistant and they know even less than the dermatology physicians. So again, approach with caution. It's not a knock necessarily on those folks. I am getting to the point now where I am sending them, I'm circumventing, but at the VA, I have to go through all kinds of things. And I'm kind of working my way around derm and going right to plastics. And it's usually ocular plastics like the comment included. I just want to add one other stupid thing. And that's that when they took out my basal cell carcinoma, I made him sh sort of tell, tell me all the way through what was happening. And he made the cut on the skin in this direction. And I said, how come you're doing it that way? This is an ocular plastics person. He said, because if you keloidal, you heal too aggressively, your skin will pinch up and you'll wind up with an ectropion and then you'll have ocular surface disease. So these are the sorts of things that go into the thinking of a person who is imaginative and creative like a oculoplastic surgeon where you might not get that from just a dermatologist removing it. I agree with that, that question. So here's the last question picture on this slide, and this is one where you scratch your head. And I think the point here is that this is an interesting, less common form of a pigment of basal cell carcinoma. And you just have to say to yourself, what was this person thinking, letting this get to this point? Now they're symptomatic, they have peripheral. It's probably somewhat painful where it shouldn't be painful. And, and you know, this is a totally different uh, level of care where this person's probably going to have an excision and a full thickness skin graft. And if they would have addressed this earlier, it would not be this involved. They were scared. They were scared. I, I one time actually had a patient with something that looked very similar to that said something to me like, if I needed to go to the doctor, the Lord would deliver one. Oh. And so I said to that patient, the Lord delivered you to me and I know to send you to one. And she did go and it was skin cancer. So these are the four, these are the five major clinical types of basal cell carcinoma. We're concentrating mostly on nodular ulcerative. I brought up sclerosing or morpheiform. Those two are the most common forms of basal cell carcinoma you'll see above the head and neck. Every once in a while, we'll see a pigmented lesion, fibroepithelioma and superficial basal cell carcinoma are more often times in the chest or in the legs or the arms. So we're not going to talk and have many examples of fibroepithelioma or superficial uh, basal cell carcinoma. And many times there's are more involved with syndromes as well, where people have dozens of basal cell carcinoma across their body and it's complicated. So the primary eye care response, provider's responsibility is make sure you take a look, make sure you document. And when you're doing your routine exams, it doesn't take any time at all to do this. Spend a minute, educate the patient, get them into the right hands. Here's a case where, I, this was right before I started at the VA. This woman came in for a routine eye examination. She wanted to get a different pair of bifocals and she came with her daughter for a reason. Her daughter demanded she accompany her mom to this exam. So this is a look at the patient. Just take a look at a second and see what you notice. Uh, she has a pair of glasses that we're gonna fix, but look at her nares, the right side of her nose. She has this skin lesion, right? So this is, this is my opinion. This is what we have to be looking at, not just the lids and lashes. So you see this large lesion. I said, okay, I said, you were here for your bifocal. Were you gonna bring this up? And her daughter said, I wanted you to look at this. I said, you wanted me, her optometrist, to look at a skin lesion on her nose. She knew our practice and she said, I knew you guys wouldn't let this pass. She was at her primary care provider the week before and they didn't bring it up that they wanted to do anything about it. I told her, I said, this is big, it's thin. I, tr I actually don't have a picture of, but I put the trans illuminator up her nose and it virtually lit right through this lesion. It was so thin. So I sent her to plastics. 
But this is pretty interesting as well. If you just look at this, this is the secondary thing I found when I brought the foropter in place. She had this lesion, a non-healing lesion on her ear. I said, well, what about this one? She's like, well, what are you talking about? I said, you have this sore here. It's an open sore. And sure enough, she's like, yep, I've had that for two years and it's not getting better. Well, guess what? When she went to the plastic surgeon, because I did send her to plastics, I didn't send her to oculoplastics in this case, because the Nares doesn't warrant oculoplast. It warrants just a good plastic surgeon. She came back and the ear was treated as well. So again, we're talking about that statistic 40% of the time when you see someone with one skin cancer, there's some other skin cancer somewhere else. And here you see a full thickness graft was done once that lesion was excised. And you have this little band here, but as I saw this patient over the years, this band was uh, surgerized and it was gone and this healed even more and her nose looked much more regular and she did great. You see that lesion and as Andy mentioned, these things look scary, they look bad, but they don't have an association with metastatic disease and she did just fine and her function resumed to normal. Just uh, for those of you that are listening carefully, uh, surgerized, is from the George Bush dictionary, meaning she got surgery on that area. She was surgerized. It's a real word. I think the other one is surgiated. Surgerized is real. Any laughter at all? So this I, I'm laughing, Andy, but I'm a little disappointed that it wasn't in the uh, George Bush, Bush voice. I can't do the voice anymore. I do Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so this is this is a case, another case at the VA where this gentleman came in. This is an unfortunate case. He didn't have any health care for years. And this skin lesion, he tried to do the comb over to hide it, but he wasn't going to pull that on me. So when he got to my chair, I noticed and I said, you know, we're here to do your eye exam, but there's no way I could let you out of my exam room without addressing this. And he said, yeah, I was homeless. I didn't have any health care. I'm back at the VA. I thought you guys would bring this up. I'm like, yeah, we're going to bring it up for sure. That is a massive skin lesion. Fortunately, it was basal cell carcinoma. You can see here, I lifted that up and that is extensive, extensive. So he was, he bought himself a referral to the Philly VA uh, plastic surgery clinic. And obviously they sent him to oncology to do a bunch of studies. But what was interesting was this. I got the foropter in place and I looked at his neck and I pulled his collar down and he had this. I thought he was like involved in a strangulation. He's like, nope, I had that as well. And that's a second huge basal cell carcinoma that was on his neck. And again, Philadelphia had to surgerize it. They removed it. I want to just say, no matter how big those were, can you just go back one more? It wasn't fatal. So as ugly as that looks, here's something that looks devastating that just needs treatment. And he recovered completely and uh, it was not fatal. Short shortly, we're gonna show you some things that are very small that have a high likelihood of mortality. So yeah, there you, there you see that, that's another example. Here's an example for a patient we saw with uh, uh, actinic care, uh, I'm sorry, he had acne rosacea and he was a long time patient of mine. And then he started coming in and I noted this little area degradation of the skin. And you can see here, just the bright lights. He was had all kinds of anterior segment problems. I said, you know, we have to get this looked at too. He's like, what do you mean? That's nothing. I said, well, it's starting to evolve into something. Sure enough, I sent him to a very good local oculoplastic surgeon. And the next two or three months later, he came in looking like this, where they did Mohs micrographic surgical technique. It was basal cell carcinoma. These people are at risk. Their skin is um, oftentimes very sensitive to sun. And also, this is a case where some of the medications the patients are on for a long period of time, much like people with psoriasis, they have high incidence of skin cancer because of some of the medications that they have to take. Uh, this guy had surgery and he did quite well also. So here are some differential diagnoses. I have on the lower left, that's that's a keratoacanthoma. Keratoacanthoma actually has a greater association with sebaceous cell, car uh, I'm sorry, squamous cell carcinoma than basal cell, but it looks like that elevated central area of ulceration. But the difference is this evolves really quickly. Basal cell carcinoma can take years to develop. This uh, keratoacanthoma could look like this in a couple of weeks, if not months. So this is very fast changing. And that's something that should lead you down the road of a differential like that. The other two gentlemen you see have actinic keratosis. This is just directly related to excessive sun exposure. I took both of these pictures when I was practicing in New Jersey and a lot of New Jersey folks spend time at the beach, out on the boat. These guys might have been professionally been working in the sun, whether they were working on the water or working in construction. And the treatment for this 
is pretty much just remove yourself from the sun and sunscreen. These folks have an evolution uh, into having a primary skin cancer at about 20% rate. But the good news is oftentimes these folks are always practitioner that is looking at their skin because of this problem. So if they do develop a primary skin cancer, it's oftentimes early detected. Let's move on to the second form of primary skin cancer, squamous cell. So here you can see, well, the other skin cancer had 70, 80% of the time. This is only 10% of the time. And as you can see, it looks remarkably the same. Um, but the one thing that's, we'll get that question in one minute. Uh, the one place that's different is this is usually found on mucous membranes in and around the conjunctiva and or in the mouth. And the big difference between this one and the last one, in addition to increased mortality, is this one's typically painful. And so squamous cell carcinoma has a propensity to want to find nerves and or blood vessels and penetrate and grow deep what is called invasive growth. Uh, if it grows along the uh, blood vessel perivascular and one of the common things that you'll find in the, uh, your Metatrec, uh, not Metatrec, uh, PubMed uh, research is perineural invasion. These tumors love to grab a hold of the nerves, grow deep, and that's how they get to other organs and affect other organ systems, makes them very dangerous. Do you wanna answer that question? So yeah, as Andy mentioned, there's a greater likelihood your dentist finds more squamous cell carcinoma than we will. When they look at the oral mucosa, if you go for your teeth cleaning, uh, your, surgeon, your, your dentist will open your mouth and look at all the oral mucosa for that very reason. That's what they're doing. They're looking for squamous cell carcinoma. Let me pop in on this question real quick. Can a skin injury or infection evolve into basal or other cancers with typically we typically think of cancers evolving from sun exposure. Well, you know, the thing is, is that we talked about the compromised integrity of the skin. So if you have an injury, let's say the injury could be thermal. Let's say the injury could be a laceration. If it's large enough and you have a scarring that might be keloidal, uh, it can change the integrity of the skin and make it more vulnerable over your lifetime that it can evolve into a problem. Now, I don't think that if you have a cut on your arm or your face, you need to worry about that in the short term uh, being at risk of developing to a skin cancer. You know, when you're treating someone for a laceration of the face, you don't necessarily say, listen, we need to suture this. We need to give you an antibiotic so you don't get skin cancer. It's not like that. It's just that over the course of time, because the change in the integrity of the skin, it does make the skin more vulnerable. And, and any injury that's chronic. Okay. So yeah, like we said here, oral mucosa, conjunctiva, here are some significant statistics worth mentioning. Cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, as we saw the statistics plummet uh, versus basal cell carcinoma. However, there, are a, there is a greater incidence of, of metastatic disease. And this is really the first time where, where we're, we should bring up the fact that when you have someone who has a suspicious skin lesion, it's not a bad idea to consider palpating the preauricular submandibular or sublingual lymph nodes to see if there is any lymphadenopathy in those areas. And again, that's what your dentist does. Your dentist, when he's looking at your own mucosa, he's also palpating your neck to see if you have any lymphadenopathy or any glands that are involved uh, for, for cancerous reasons as well. So we could do that as well. If we see something on our, our lids, we should be looking at those glands to make sure there's no adenopathy would also really make that referral urgent. So we're now getting into the concept of metastatic disease. Here's another question there. Coming in fast and furious. Can I, no, that's the same one. Oh, well, it's, I, I saw the one. Come uh, on, dude, what are you doing here? I was surging. Okay, <laughs> you were surgerized. Anyway, okay, so that's taken care of. All right. So this is, we mentioned earlier immune suppression. So people who have uh, organ transplant recipients, that's OTR, organ transplant recipients, they are at higher risk to develop squamous cell carcinoma because you see this flow chart. I'm going to get down to the nitty gritty of the flow chart. The nitty gritty of the flow chart is essentially that UV light exposure is more sensitive to these patients, perhaps because they're medications. And also the immune suppression, as you see here, uh, there is different ways that immune suppression will have an effect on the skin associated with chronic inflammation. Uh, the, you know, I, I have to put my readers on. This is pretty small. Hold on. 
reduced uh, tumor defense and beta pa the, the uh, papillomavirus. So all of these things can become more prominent when people are immune suppressed chemically following an organ transplantation. And this is part of the organ transplant team's responsibility. I have multiple patients that have organ transplants and part of their counseling prior to getting a transplant and post transplant is watching for skin cancers. And the counseling includes sun exposure, taking their medicines properly and follow up. So these people, it's a known risk factor and it's something that they have to consider for a lifetime, not just acutely following their organ transplant, but these large organ transplants, as you see, like lung, heart, kidney, liver, uh, other types of transplants are all at risk. So they have an increase uh, by 60 uh, fold at least. So that's something to consider when you see someone who has a skin cancer that you're suspicious of to ask if they actually had that. And hopefully you have that on your medical record. Here's a case when I was uh, working with ophthalmology and this patient presented with a garden variety, we thought, uh, sixth cranial nerve palsy. And he had a lot going on medically. This gentleman was in his 80s, he had a history of stroke, he had a history of myocardial infarction, he had a history of diabetes. And then he presented with what our ophthalmologist start, thought was a garden variety sixth, vasculopathic sixth. So he said, you know what, Mark, I'm slammed. I'm I do surgery, you do this stuff, you see them. And I got them at the 30 day mark. If I had this case nowadays, and I think there's a trend where we're imaging these people earlier, we're not waiting for the 90 days like we taught, we were taught 20 years ago. I would have imaged this guy very early on, not at day 90, but this gentleman presented uh, with the six palsy and you see it on his right. He has an esotropy on his right. So I'm like, okay. But if you also take note, he has all kinds of skin issues. He has telangiectasia. He looks like a rosacea kind of guy. But here you see this ulceration on his ear. He has old scarring here. And sure enough, if you ask him, he had multiple basal cell carcinoma removed. You could see down here. And he just is an old white guy. And that's who gets skin cancers, older folks. And he's Northern European descent. He's an older Irishman. And he is highly susceptible uh, to damage to his skin over the course of time. So he presented this way and I'm like, okay, so this is actually day 90. This is when I saw him on his, on his 90th day. So he does not have improvement of the sixth nerve palsy. I said, okay, you bought yourself a neuro-ophthalmology consult and that's what I did. But just to show you for, just to be completely comprehensive, his motilities, you see there, he doesn't have any abduction to the right. Everything else looks pretty darn good just to confirm that he had the sixth. But what's really, significant here is if you look at this picture, here's what is in contrast or juxtaposes Andy's comments about some things that look horrible aren't dangerous. This right here is the squamous cell carcinoma and it's in the facial triangle and there's a lot of action in the facial triangle. So me doing this 15 years ago, I said, listen, okay, so you have a sixth I have to send you to neuro-ophthalmology and we're going to look at the sixth. And I didn't send them to a skin guy, whether it's an oculoplastic or dermatologist. I was just concentrating on the neuro-ophthalmologic uh, presentation. So I sent him to a guy named Mark Moser, a very good neuro-op guy in our, in our uh, area. And he got back to me right away. And he said, this gentleman has multiple cranial nerve involvement. He, I, I didn't check his corneal sensitivity. He had depressed corneal sensitivity, he had facial nerve involvement, and he had cranial nerve six nerve involvement. So when he had multiple nerve involvement, Dr. Moster imaged him. And sure enough, there was a tumor found in the cavernous sinus, an area called Meckel's Cave, where these nerves all travel. And this had what Andy termed earlier perineural invasion. So this squamous cell carcinoma invaded deep in the skin, latched onto a nerve, traveled into the cavernous sinus, and this killed him. This small lesion killed this gentleman. By the time he had his sixth cranial nerve palsy, regardless if he would have sent him on day one, 30, 60, or 90, he was already at a point where there was multiple nerves involved and it was invading his cranial vault. And the family did not want to do any aggressive care. So he lived about another six months, I think, and then unfortunately passed over this type of skin cancer, which is super scary. I'll never forget it. And it really changed how I uh, 
think about both neuro-ophthalmologic cases. Here you see the facial and trigeminal nerves and where they run in that facial triangle. Uh, it really changed how I think about these lesions. This is another case of a squamous cell carcinoma. This gentleman was from Puerto Rico. He came up to visit his family in New Jersey and they said, you know, maybe why you're in the United States and not in Puerto Rico living in a rainforest area where he didn't have a lot of access. He said, maybe we should get that looked at while you're here. And I almost fell out of my chair when I saw this lesion because that lesion was so large, it cracked the gray line. And you see the bloody uh, presentation here. And this went right to Cooper Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. And they imaged this guy from head to toe. Interestingly enough, they resected this and he had no metastatic disease and he did fine. So let's move on to sebaceal, sebaceous cell carcinoma in Andy's going to jump back in. So sebaceous cell carcinoma, we went from 70% down to 10%. And so now you can see less than 5% of these cases uh, uh, occupy the skin cancer sort of lesion. And so you can see right in here, matterosis. It's generally women a little bit more than men, but it's generally more lethal. And the biggest issue is that if it hasn't worked its way up into anything that is symptomatic for the patient and you have this only this teeny bit of lash loss, it's easy to miss. And so you want to make sure that you're on top of this, actually have a case of this. Is that in this? Of course it is. Uh, where I, I saw a woman, she's got an area of batterosis. She's got a small area that I photo documented and measured. I send it to the ophthalmic plastic surgeon. The ophthalmic plastic surgeon says it's in a funny place. If we take it off, it could cause some ocular surface issues. It's probably nothing. And so we'd rather just watch it. And so it's very important on all these cases that you mm -hmm. do not do nothing. You do something. Doing anything is doing something. And so I always bring these people back in what a reasonable, what sounds like a reasonable amount of time. So I asked this person to come back and see me in three to four months. And sure enough, since I had measurements and photographs, I was able to determine that the thing is bigger. And so I sent it back to that oculoplastic surgeon who then did a biopsy on it. And it turned out to be sebaceous cell carcinoma, which killed her. And so I'm just saying, it never hurts for you to, so you can sleep at night, to do something, see them back in a reasonable amount of time and make the professional referral. The other thing that's highly important is that this is the first cancer we're talking about that has no predilection to race. So anyone could get these cancers. This is just an aberrant problem that happens at the sebaceous cell level. So you may hear interchangeably sebaceous cell, sebaceous gland, meibomian gland, meibomian cell carcinoma, because the meibomian glands are what are most oftentimes involved. The glands of Zeiss, the glands of Mole are also sebaceous cell, sebaceous glands we see in the upper and lower lids and the brow. So the greatest density of sebaceous cell or sebaceous glands is that area of the face. So that's why we included in this lecture because it is important to talk about. And for me, the most important thing that I think we should concentrate on when we talk about this form of carcinoma is that it mimics a lot of common things. It mimics chalazion, it mimics hordeoloma, it mimics papillomas, just benign situations that we see here. This is small. This doesn't look all that offensive. This is not affecting the way this woman's upper lid is working, but it's growing slowly and there's lash loss. So when we are inspecting the lid as we have the biomicroscope on there, we should be palpating that, moving that, questioning the patient and monitoring that closely to determine if it is more than just a benign papilloma. Here you see a case, right eye involvement. You see a little bit of redness, a little bit of almost ptosis looking presentation, almost looking like blepharitis. Who gets, who gets unilateral blepharitis? I mean, that's just not the way it presents, right? It's more of a systemic problem. So blepharitis, when you see a case that just doesn't make sense, if you see a case that you think is blepharitis and you treat it like blepharitis and it doesn't respond, you have to scratch your head and say, common things respond to common treatments. So 
this is where I get con a little bit concerned about this diagnosis. And I like to spend extra time just driving that home because this could sneak up on us. And as you saw, there's a significant amount of mortality associated when you do have local lymphadenopathy or lymph findings positive on testing. Here's, this is a gland of mole. You see again, very small lesion, very benign looking, but this is a gland of mole sebaceous cell, sebaceous gland carcinoma. Then we have some differentials just to drive the point home even further. That's on the top, that's an old trauma where you see pyogenic a, a, a pyogenic granuloma on the upper lid margin there, completely benign, annoying to the patient. So that was excised by a an oculoplast. Here we have a small sudoriferous cyst that's uh, just backed up. And here you see just some fluid filled cysts on the upper lid. Again, totally benign situations that oftentimes that, that mimic what we're talking about here this evening. I just want to tell you one thing. I just I had a patient like this recently uh, and they were on blood thinners and they scratched their eye and it bled. And they actually were sent up from the emergency room because they couldn't stop the bleeding. And so the way you stop the bleeding in these cases is just literally take a cotton tip applicator and hold it on there really tight and you can't move once you do that. I eventually did get the bleeding stopped and what made it go away was a steroid antibiotic combination because excision of these things is actually more complicated than you think. This is a pyogenic granuloma and they commonly occur following surgery or an injury. Super. This is just a big one. This is a big one. This guy didn't want to do anything about this for the longest time. And it took years, if not decades to grow. And I said, you know what? Chances are this is benign, but I, I can't with a good heart watch you walk around like this. So he actually had this excised and, and it was benign. So the contrast to small, but scary, large, scary looking for a good reason, but really not that dangerous. He had that excise and he did perfectly well. He is a happy man. He could wear a hat again normally. So, yeah. And this is Andy's case. Yeah, this, this is my case. And so here you can see when I sent her, the area here, almost all the lashes are gone on her lower lid. There's certainly no, almost no lashes at all on the lid here. And so what I want to say to all of you is that it's hard for you to get in trouble if you make a diagnosis and you're wrong, as long as you check whatever it is you thought it was in a reasonable amount of time. And so if you, doing anything is doing something. And so I said, all right, I'm gonna send you to an oculoplastic surgeon that I'm familiar with, and then let me see you back no matter what happens in two to four months. And when she came back, I had already gotten the report from the surgeon. They didn't want to do anything. And you can see that this is bigger. And so I got on the phone with the surgeon. I said, come on, this thing's bigger. You, you got to do something. And that's when they discovered it. And so uh, it, it, you don't always have to be right. You just have to be persistent and you have to be ethical. So the big thing here is that, you know, as we mentioned, we're not trying to turn anyone into an oculoplastic surgeon or a dermatologist. Right. But, you know, when you look at that, you would have to either judge your treatment by the characteristics or biopsy that. So if you're going to biopsy that, you might as well remove it. And the surgeon didn't want to remove it based on where its location was, and it wasn't bothering the patient. So that's why it wasn't investigated and it passed some time. And then finally, when they removed it, they biopsied it. And that's what we're going to talk about treatment in a second. And we're going to talk about timing of treatment and forms of treatment and how certain treatments allow for uh, adequate biopsy and, and again, the, econ the economics of all that. So here we go. Question number three. So Greg, you, Greg, hello. Uh, so the most common periocular skin, oh, well, I think I put that out of order, buddy. You know, it's put up, Greg. Yeah, all right. We're on number I, one. I, you, I'm here. Can you do me a favor? Can you put up question four from poll? You know how you have poll three there? Can you go poll four? I, I actually, yeah, I, I actually changed that, buddy. I should have let you know. But that you, nice recovery, pal. 
what, st <laughs> what statement is false regarding sebaceous cell carcinoma? Is the cause of approximately 50% of malignant malignancies involving the anexa most common in the sixth and seventh decade of life affects women greater than men, no predilection to race. What statement is false? Hopefully we have a good number of returns here and we could get rocking and rolling. They're coming in. I think all this really, this technology is really cool. All right, we're going to end the poll right now. Share the results, and there you go. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent work, folks. Good stuff. Okay. So, yeah, people can get this. There's no predilection to race. It affects women more than men, most common in the later in life. And the wrong, an the, the correct answer, the one that's false, is cause of approximately 50%. It's lower than 10%. So, there you have it. Okay. Remember, we're showing you carcinomas now that are more lethal, have greater mortality, but occur a lot less. And so only two to three percent of all eyelid malignancies are malignant melanoma, but malignant melanoma is deadly. And so uh, if you have malignant melanoma, uh, even if it is excised properly, it's very spindly, which means it's hard to get all the cells. And so even though they do Mohs, which means that they're excising tissue down to clean tissue that they're looking at using a microscope at the time of the biopsy, a lot of times some of the spindly cells escape, mm -hmm. get into the blood vessel system, find another source of blood somewhere else in the body, start a secondary lesion and go on to kill you. So even though it's only two to 3% of eye malignancies, and by the way, uh, because we're living longer, and we're spending more time outdoors, especially now during the pandemic, it's actually growing in incidence. Uh, it's much more lethal. Yeah. I don't see the point in reading the slide to you because I know you can read the slide, but Mark has some clinical points that he'd like to make. Well, there's no question that the main clinical point is that we have to be really conscious when we're dealing with our younger patients. And we're gonna wrap up tonight with some educational slides, but this, this really drives home the point that younger people get this more oftentimes because developed countries, people have money, they go on vacation, they go where it's sunny, they golf, they fish, they swim, they, they hike, they, they, they ski. And not every time someone does those activities, they're thinking about sun protection. What's worth bringing up is that women oftentimes do better with a lot, well, not oftentimes. Women, let's face it, they have better hygiene than we do. You know, that's the bottom line. So they take care of their skin much better than men do. And on top of that, women who wear makeup, modern makeup has SPF in it. So when women apply makeup, they're essentially putting sunscreen on every day. And that's awesome. And that's going to help in the long run reduce the incidence of uh, skin cancers of all forms. So here's a World Health Organization report from 2000, where it shows just the increased rate per 100,000 globally of malignant melanoma. And you could see from 1950 to 2000, that number increased eightfold. And I could pretty much tell you that that rate has gone up again. It's probably not as significant of a increase, but it's definitely gone in the direction of increasing since 2000. So in the last 20 years. So malignant melanoma has a characteristic that we're all familiar with, darkly pigmented uh, presentation on the skin. Uh, it can bleed and can become ulcerated as it advances. These people generally don't have a lot of symptoms of pain or discomfort or, or eyelid uh, function that's impaired, uh, but you see this large lesion that's growing over time and it definitely should get our uh, our attention when the patient comes in and we're monitoring regularly. The big difference between the other three <laughs> cancers is that if you look at basal cell carcinoma, it's usually around the lid margin. The sebaceous cell carcinoma is usually around the lid margin. And squamous cell carcinoma is usually on the mucous membrane, actually inside the conjunctiva and or caruncle or around the lid margin. Malignant melanoma can be anywhere on the face. And so you can see that in this particular case, it's all the way down here. And so anything that looks like a dark black uh, lesion that may or may not disobey A, B, C, D, E, you should be suspicious of. Yep. 
So we have a couple cases to talk about. It's the scheming is, there's several ways to scheme uh, and stage these patients, but I just wanted to talk in this area where if we're dealing with lids and lashes, I think what's important, as I mentioned a little bit ago, is looking and palpating the lymph nodes to see if there's any local lymphadenopathy because that could be predictive of how aggressive the skin cancer is. Dermatology and plastic surgery and, and oncology has different ways of staging malignant melanoma. Since it is such a complicated uh, cancer, cutaneous malignant melanoma, there are other, there's other forms of systemic malignant melanoma that have a staging scheme as well. And fortunately with melanoma, this has been a much more uh, treatable type diagnosis because of immunotherapy, more customized treatments. And people years ago would be pretty much given a death sentence if they have malignant melanoma. So if there's 4 million new cases a year of, melano uh, of skin cancer in the United States, four or 5 million new cases, about 75,000 to 100,000 are cutaneous malignant melanoma. But unfortunately, they make up the vast majority of, of, of mortality associated with skin cancer. So there's an extraordinarily high association with mortality of, of advanced malignant melanoma. And that's why it gets so much attention in the world of dermatology and plastic surgery. So what is very predictive is the depth. Size definitely matters with regards to the overall presentation on the surface of the skin, greater than that six millimeter, raising the level of suspicion. But when it comes to depth, when these are biopsy, it gets the attention uh, of the person doing the biopsy when it's deeper than one millimeter. It can have a much more significant association with mortality and spreading to both, to both local and distant lymph, and lymph nodes. So if you have, just for example, to make it clear to those of you uh, listening is that local lymphadenopathy would be the preauricular submandibular and sublingual lymph nodes, but distance would be abdominal lymph nodes, for example. So if you have a skin lesion on your face and you have abdominal lymph node involvement, that is, that's very uh, ominous. That's an ominous predictor, as you see here with the mortality rate. It only takes a couple lymph nodes to really escalate that mortality rate where we have significant mortality involved. I'm gonna just peek up here because I think I saw a question come rolling in. Let's see here. Can keloids develop into carcinomas or melanomas? It's very rare. So keloids, the question is, can keloids develop into carcinoma or melanoma? I mentioned a little bit ago about anytime you change the integrity of the skin, you change its protective quality. So any scarring, elevates the risk of developing a skin cancer. I think that's the safest way to, to, to respond to that question. And a keloid is just an aggressive type of scar, okay? Some people keloid, some people don't keloid, but when you have any form of scarring, you modify the integrity of the skin, making it more, more vulnerable to the environment. If you look in the literature, it's rare. A keloid is just an aggressive, over-aggressive scar formation and typically they do not develop into malignancies. Good. So here's a case where I mentioned that, you know, we most oftentimes stick to the head and neck, but this woman came in one day and she said, I have sudden vision loss, painless vision loss in my right eye. I said, well, that doesn't sound good. And I said, is there anything I should know about your case? And she said, well, I'm dying of cutaneous melanoma. I said, well, okay, why would you start to go blind and lose vision in one eye out of the blue. She said, this is a very aggressive form. Here's the lesion. She said the lesion was the size of a nickel on her arm. And that's what the most surgical uh, scar looked like. And she was given a very short period of time to live. She was given the option of getting a very aggressive form of cancer. They said, if we get cancer treatment, she said, if we give you this cancer treatment, she told me her oncologist mentioned to her, she had to go to Lehigh Valley Medical Center up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. They said, if you go for this treatment, you have about nine months to live and six months you'll be sick every day. She said, well, I don't wanna go through that. So she didn't wanna go through the aggressive care. So she would go to the beach with her husband and walk on the beach every day and tried to live her life with quality uh, and not be sick every day. And she said she was walking on the beach and she couldn't see out of her right eye. So she came to me, she had an afferent pupillary defect. I think she had count finger vision. And let me just show you a few things here. I said, okay, got to get you looked at. So I dilated her. I look in the back of her eye. Actually, I'm lying. I guess it was her left eye. It was her left eye. So the day I have this case, my digital camera, my fundus camera is not working, but I had an old HRT. So I took the HRT and I said, I'm going to take HRT images. And I used the 3D function 
to show you some of these pictures. So you could see here, pretty regular looking right nerve, correct? But this is like volcanic. This is so elevated, you could see this diffuse, obvious degree of, um, of uh, optic disc edema. So I have another picture here that I just, in, in lieu of a good digital image, I'm showing you what that looked like in that 3D function when we used to look at those old HRTs. And, and it's obvious, but you know, now that I looked after, after reviewing the case and presenting this case to folks, the right eye was a bit elevated as well. And you'll see in a second what I mean. So I sent this down the hall where we were in New Jersey, Mark Moster, who I mentioned earlier, who's a neuro-ophthalmologist, I sent her to him and he immediately saw her. And you can see here some of the, uh, the, the images. You see here a coronal view. You start to catch a little bit of the optic nerve and here you see a little bit of tumor formation, but you really get your bang for your buck here. When you look at the sagittal presentation of her left eye, you see this tumor I'm, I'm going around here. And here you see, uh, this axial presentation. Look at the size of this tumor in her left orbit. And what it's doing is it's encompassing, here I blew it up. Here it's encompassing the optic nerve. It's putting pressure on the lateral rectus, the medial rectus. You can't see, I, I guess it would be the superior rectus on this view. You can see the start of the superior rectus, but that's behind this image. That's huge. It's almost as big as the eyeball. And it just finally encompassed the optic nerve and had an impact on the optic nerve. And she essentially went blind from this. That's scary. But what's scarier to me is if you look on her right eye, the periosteum has this invasion here where you have another metastatic tumor from that 10 to 20 millimeter lesion on her arm that was so aggressive that this metastatic lesion occurred and look at what it's doing to the optic nerve. It's starting to bend the optic nerve. So the message was very, very difficult to deliver that chances are she would, well, we knew she wasn't gonna gain any vision in the left eye, but chances are she would start to have visual impairments in her right eye. So Dr. Moser and I, unfortunately to counsel this woman, uh, and again, unfortunately she didn't have long to live and she actually passed shortly after. This was very ominous and she went to her oncologist right away and they were very concerned. Here you see another uh, coronal view. Look at this size of this lesion. Look what, look what it's doing to the optic nerve. And here you just see the proximity of that medial uh, lesion in the right eye and it's abutting the optic nerve here you see. So, so very sad, sad case and how aggressive the malignant melanoma is. Here, here's another case. I just had this guy a few months ago, but just to drive the point home, look at this guy's arms. Look at this guy's head. He has all of these suspicious areas. And oh, by the way, he had a malignant melanoma, cutaneous melanoma removed years ago. So this guy goes to his uh, dermatologist and plastic surgeon every three months. He's monitored every three months because of his history. And he's, he's closely watched. Unfortunately, he's had another problem. These are just some examples of malignant melanoma. You see this on the lid margin, very thin lid margin, very, uh, Poor prognosis with this patient. You see the discoloration, you see the size. That's a poor prognosis. Here, and you have lash loss, you have matarosis. Here's uh, a, a change in the upper lid and a change in the conjunctiva. Again, a case of malignant melanoma, cutaneous melanoma. This one's involving the caruncle, and this was excised by the oculoplastic surgeon who was at the Eye Institute at the time. I'm gonna see if we just had a question come in here. That was Greg. <laughs> we double thank you. Yeah, Greg, thanks, Greg. Okay, so we have time yet. I thought Greg. Yeah. Okay, so he, this guy was important, right? John McCain was a very important man. And when he was running for the, the presidency the last time uh, he was a candidate, he actually went, after he dropped from the race, he immediately announced that he had a, 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 a third or fourth case of his malignant melanoma. You see here, I'm circling it on his, left temporal area and he had that excise. And the reason why I show Senator McCain is that he was very outspoken and he did a lot of public relations and raised awareness of skin cancers. And he, he was a cancer survivor for many years. And then unfortunately, as we all know, he passed from metastatic disease associated with these cancers. But Mr. McCain, you know, an older uh, gentleman who was in the sun and unfortunately as a, uh, as a prisoner of war, he was exposed to harsh sun exposure while he was a prisoner of war, and that absolutely contributed 
to his development of skin cancers. So Greg, this question is number three. Do you know how I told you I flip flop? So if you put up poll question number three, the one you had up at first last time. I, I, I have I, to reset it here, Mark. Hold on a second. No rush. I'll, I'll just read it while you're doing that. The most common periocular skin malignancy is which of the following? A, malignant melanoma, B, keratoacanthoma, C, basal cell carcinoma, or C, squamous cell carcinoma. Sorry, I should have given you a heads up. No I like, worries. I like keeping you on your toes, Greg. And we can. We, we, uh, we know how to handle some of these uh, technological, uh, you know, computer shutdown, electricity goes off. We know how to tap dance. Okay. I guess I have to answer this poll too. I always get them right. It's great. I answered the wrong one. All right. So it's up and running and uh, looks like we have a high percentage of people that have answered. So I'm just going to end the poll for you. Yeah. I'm going to share the results. Good stuff. Well, basal cell you... carcinoma is the most common skin cancer by far. Okay. Everyone needs to get that correct. Okay. Keratocanthoma is really rare, comes up really, really fast and looks terrible. Basal cell carcinoma is by far the most common. Squamous cell after that. Yep. Malignant melanoma, only 2 to 3%. Very good. Good job, everybody. Okay, so let's roll. So I'm just going to say, um, you know, it's tricky business uh, when it comes to treating this stuff because you have to be able to endure the treatment. So if it were me, I would want it removed. And so there's two ways for you to understand what it is, and that's incisional biopsy and excisional biopsy. All my biopsies were excisional. Um, and a punch biopsy is an incisional biopsy where you just take a piece of it without removing the entire thing. And so a dermatologist may do an incisional biopsy, find out what it is, and then leave all the excisional materials to the person that's taking care of you. Generally, the four ways that you can treat any of these cancers are to cut it out, to apply heat to it or radiation, that's cook it, cut, cook, chemotherapy, poison it, cut, cook, poison, or freeze it, cryotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so you'll meet with somebody to discuss your ability to withstand the surgery, to uh, see how cosmetically this will go best for you, and then your team will come up with an approach. And so uh, both of my surgeries were uh, excisional, and both of my surgeries were done by a Mohs trained surgeon. That means they attended Mohs College and got a certificate for understanding to know how to do the Mohs procedure. So just, just to make it clear, uh, Mohs College doesn't have a football team. Uh, that's a, it's a theoretical college where it's, it's a training center and it's based in San Diego. And it's just like going for extra credentialing. So they call it Mohs College. And actually a lot of people do a modified Mohs micrographic surgical technique because Mohs is expensive. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I just want to spend a couple seconds on this slide. How do you spell Mohs? M-O-H-S. And who's it named after? Frederick Mohs. Okay, so it's, it's actually named after the guy that came up with the, the, the procedure in theory. Right. So here you see a large skin lesion. And sometimes Mohs surgical procedures look awful right after the procedure. But the main goal is to preserve as much skin as possible and get as much cancer as possible at one time. And I'll talk about that in a second, like I said. So here you see just some older scars that are a, a little choppy looking, not perfect. But what I wanna just do is talk about these two scars where you do have that banding of scarring or cicatricial scars, it's called, and you have this ectropion phenomenon and exposure, which you know a good surgeon wants to preserve the lid globe congruity. And hopefully you're not seeing that when you send someone for skin cancer surgery. Here's the, bunch, the, the punch biopsy. If you smoke cigars, it looks like a punch cigar cutter. That's or all it looks like, treatment. a trephine. And Andy talked about the different types of treatments, cut, radiation, freeze, poison, and let's roll into the treatments so we get them through. So what most micrographic surgical technique does, it, graphs, it, it, it maps out the, the lesion involved it gets put on a slide in frozen sections and it's looked at in real time uh, by histology. So here you see a case where you have a lesion and here you see its markings. And I actually got these slides from Mohs Surgical um, College. They wouldn't send me video, they would only send me slides. So these are actually slides from their package. Uh, and here you see it debulked. 
So they remove the majority of the superficial part of the lesion and that gets looked at by histology. And then you see the deeper cuts. So it goes down and out. So peripherally, they get to viable tissue. Depth-wise, they get to viable tissue. And what this does is allows you to get to margins that are sound. And theoretically, you get more lesion. Theoretically, you have less occurrence and needing to go in for a secondary type treatment, whether it's surgery or one of the other treatments we're going to talk about in a minute. You're awake the whole time. They keep numbing you as you go. You don't feel anything. It feels a little wet when they're doing it. And they're running the tissue things that you see right here back and forth to the lab. So I actually got up with a big gash in my face and walked over and they showed me where they were doing is just a couple of rooms down. They actually plate the stuff to take a look at it and they don't sew you back together till there's nothing else that they see. So you see here, here's the debulking, here's the quadrants, here's it being marked. So when it goes back to histology, they could tell you exactly which section is being looked at and what needs to be done more, okay? So this, just to make sure that you guys understand it, this is a big lesion on his forehead. This is his eye, this is his nose, and this is his ear. Wow, that's like Picasso drawing, right? <laughs> and here you see it sewed up. Almost looks like a temporal artery biopsy, but oh, that's it sewn up. A lot of times the side effect of this is that the area is actually depressed. So a lot of times, even after the bandage is removed and the, and the scar heals, you can still see an area that is from the debulking is still a little bit indented. So do you remember the gentleman I showed you who was visiting from Puerto Rico with the large uh, squamous cell carcinoma? Here he is at Cooper Hospital. The day they did the surgery, they debulked that. And here he is two months later. And that's not bad. That's that looks incredible. Really and I have pictures even after that period of time where it looks great. It looks great. So they just debulked that, did Mohs micrographic surgical, absolutely no metastatic disease on this fella. Question? Here it is later. So this is a couple months later. Here's a couple years later. He came in, he hit his head. Look at this. He had ecchymosis and he had blunt trauma, but here you see that nicely healed, excuse me, no lashes, but his lid function's pretty good and he is cancer free. Let me see, I think we have another question. Okay, good. Yeah, fans, we agree. Yeah, it looks very good. Kudos to the surgeon. So radiation therapy is another more diffuse disseminated treatment. And as I started the lecture off, we talked about the new studies that's, that support watchful waiting. Well, if someone can't tolerate surgery, uh, is a bleeder, has other medical complications that put them at risk for undergoing surgery, you might deliver non-surgical options. And one of the common non-surgical options that works very well for squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma and has pretty good results is radiation treatment, but it's a little more broad-based, if you will, versus localized as surgery. So it's not necessarily a first-line treatment. It's reserved for folks who just can't undergo surgery. So it has a really good cure rate, but it has a little higher recurrence rate overall versus most. Sorry about that. I went back. We have the other thing is you're only allowed to have so much radiation over your lifetime and you can run out. So if it does come back, this will, option won't be on the table anymore. The other thing is also it's uh, very important they aim the thing in the right area so you don't get collateral damage. We're talking about cryo? You had cryo, didn't you? No. Uh, yes, I did have cryo. Actually, uh, on my nose, I had another lesion that was precancerous, but not cancerous. And you see what they're doing is right here. And uh, it just uh, burns. You, you feel like uh, somebody's scraping your nose. It's not too bad. And uh, cryotherapy only takes a couple minutes and you can see it, uh, that they do it. And then the lesion uh, smooths out quite nicely. So I was very happy with the treatment. Not as specific, not as localized, a little more broad based, right? And, and, and it does have a potential impact. Chemotherapy is a way more aggressive form of treatment reserved for non-surgical cases, reserved for much more broad-based type cancers. And you know it's expensive, you know it has other side effects, so it's not a primary type treatment. Photodynamic therapy, you can inject it with the sensitizer, with the sensitizer and you go back in and they, they, they treat the areas that light up. I've been treated with also chemotherapy. Uh, five fluorouracil comes in a cream and you put it on your face. I'm gonna show them that. Oh, okay. So yeah, we'll get right. to that. All right, yeah. great. That's a good, that, I'll, I'll I'm just you. telling you, you look like hell. I'll let you talk <laughs> about that. Interferons are more- There it is. Imiquimod. Yeah. So Andy, go ahead, you'll, you'll talk about this. Yeah, this is Imiquimod, but I had a different cream called 5 fluorouracil cream come in a big tube and you just put it right on the area and you'll look exactly like she does. And so people look at you funny, but you tell them you're just taking the cream for a skin issue. 
and those scabs uh, fall off. And when they fall off, it actually does a deep cleaning of your skin. So your skin is actually healthier than it was uh, before you got the treatment and hopefully the cancer falls off with it. So what I find interesting about this picture, this is maybe the oldest picture in the slide deck. This picture is from 2000. And this was an early use of Imiquimod Aldara that was used by really aggressive cancer treaters in Pennsylvania. And this is an Italian woman. She's a very fair skinned Italian woman. She had broad based skin cancer. And this was the treatment. As you see, it's very scaly, unsightly, but it works great. Now it's considered pretty mainstream treatment for broad based uh, skin cancers. Uh, Greg, you want to float the fifth question. Which of the following treatment options has the most success as a primary form of treatment when removing skin cancers of the adnexa? Radiation, chemo, Mohs, or cryo? You know, in, in our practice, we have a, we have a Mohs surgeon, and, I, and I've been in with him while he has been doing this. And uh, you know, we have a lab right there, right, right in the uh, right in the office. And I've always thought Mohs, you know, somehow stood for sewing up big holes, <laughs> because that's what they're doing. Well, there's my skin cancer cream. You can All see right, we have, a, we have a nice response to this poll. I'm going to end it. I'm going to share the results. Very good. And there you go. And like I said, it's great. And Joe mentioned it's complicated, but it's more expensive. But cost averaging, eliminating recurrence and eliminating second treatments and more expensive secondary treatments, um, it's worth the investment early and less often. Who would you refer to a plastic surgeon or an oculoplastic surgeon. I am very, very partial to referring to oculoplastic surgeons when the lesion is in, in the upper or lower lids or potentially has an impact on lid globe congruity and reducing the likelihood of a band scar. And I joke with my patients, I say to them, you don't want the surgeon to come out from doing a breast augmentation and then fixing your lids. You want a lid surgeon doing your lids. And that's not a knock on a general plastic surgeon. They're great at doing things like blepharoplasties and, and other types of lid, -ish, lid uh, treatment. But as important as the surgeon is the histology report. You know, you have to have a surgeon who knows well enough that if I'm removing the suspicious lesion, I want it to go to the lab and be looked at, you know, and that might not always be the case uh, if you go to a general surgeon. Real quick, just some patient education things. It's always good to provide for our folks. When is it dangerous to be in the sun? Like I said, between 10 and three. Also, um, there's no such thing as a healthy sunburn for a child. There is such a thing as kids sunscreen. Your sunscreen you use as an adult is not the same sunscreen you could be putting on, you should be putting on your child. It can be toxic to a child's skin. I didn't know that. And all sunscreen has an expiration date. Every season, you should be getting new sunscreen. You just don't use the sunscreen at the bottom of your beach bag that's been there for the last three years because it was expensive. There's always- Also, if you have sunscreen from last year, then you weren't using it enough. That's true. The other thing is, is that the FDA has made a list of sunscreens that are actually toxic to the skin. So, you know, there are sunscreens that are healthier than others. There are sunscreens that contain chemicals that are actually carcinogenic. So be sure you're looking at the correct sunscreen when you purchase it. And you could go to the FDA website and they will list sunscreens that are appropriate. I thought it was a good idea to include good ICD-10 codes. You see here, it's broken down into lid, diagnosis, unspecified scalp neck and other places on the face. I think this is a valuable slide and we added this because so many people were coming up and ask how you code and there's good codes for this so you get paid properly. And this was an interesting slide we found from 1949. They tried to make sunscreen at like a gas station pump where you just spray it all over your body, man. Uh, and obviously we know that didn't take off. That wasn't well received uh, for good reason. They paid that model a good, good idea, bad execution. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> if oculoplastic surgeons are not available, sending to a dermatologist who does Mohs procedure would be preferred. There's no question, Crystal. And you know, again, we're spoiled. You know, we joke around in the greater Philadelphia, you can throw a rock up in the air and it'll come down and hit someone who takes care of eyes, right? But if you're in the middle of South Dakota and the next person is two hours away, 
you could go to a general ophthalmologist who maybe is really good at taking these skin lesions away. Bottom line is you have to know who in your area is the appropriate person to send them to and feel comfortable with uh, management that way. I just want to chime in, as I mentioned, another way to look at the way Mark handled the problem is, or, and as Crystal was mentioning, is for you to refer them to a dermatologist. The dermatologist then will farm them out, hopefully to someone that is good at the procedure. All the dermatologists that I've ever uh, had that made the diagnoses on me didn't do any of the cutting. They sent me to somebody more qualified to get the right cosmetic result as, the, as well as the right biopsy result. So the last slide, just some information again. This is what Andy and I look like when we go fishing. I mean, head to toe, SPF clothing. I'm the up. one in the. I'm the one down here. Yeah. So, so yeah. Mark looks a lot different. <laughs> yeah. So this guy, this guy, I, I think he's ready to go noodling or something. But we, this okay. is how we fish, okay. and these are some good, good uh, links to get some information. So hopefully that was informative. Hopefully you got something out of it. If there's any questions, you can pop in and let us know. Otherwise, it, you know, we always get excited about doing this presentation. We think it's awfully informative. We think it has huge implications. It's one of those things that I guarantee you go to work tomorrow and you see people over the age of 50, you will come across something, you scratch your head and say, man, I'm, I'm wondering if I should do something about this. And quite honestly, usually the answer is yes, you should. I think we just got one more chat. Going back to skin cancer on the face, are any of the cosmetic lasers for the skin with heat considered a risk for skin cancer or prevention. Um, the, the new lasers for cosmetics like dermabrasion or any like resurfacing and resculpting, they pretty much focus on the epith epithelium of the skin and they are valuable. And I think what's key here is the titration of the delivery. It's almost like a parallel with medicines that can have an implication if you use them too frequently. Or, or, or too much at one time and too much over the course of time. And the same is true with those lasers. I have to think that if you go to a reputable, reputable location that's delivering these types of treatments, they would not give you too much too frequently or over the course of time. Uh, and, and that's what I would say. So I, I don't think that they're carcinogenic if they're doing them on, their, on the face, but if you do much of anything too often, it can be damaging. I just want to say, I think it's very important for us to say, you, you have been a very attentive audience. We've enjoyed engaging with you and hopefully we've entertained you. To us, the talk went by like that. And it would be wrong of Mark and I not to thank our hosts, uh, Greg and Joe. We're uh, very grateful that they asked us to participate in their program. Uh, and thanks, fellas. We're, we're, uh, we're really grateful to you. Yeah, it's good to see everybody. You're, you're very welcome, guys. You're right. It, it, it was impactful and it, it was very educational. And I would assert there'll be a lot of people who are thinking about what you talked about tomorrow when they're, when they're seeing patients. I know that uh, I'm fortunate in our practice, we have a dermatologist, so it's very, very easy to, uh, to make these recommendations. But I thought you gave very good practical information that will be very helpful to everybody in terms of taking that next step to have the, uh, to have the conversation and start referring people on to uh, the oculoplastic surgeon, plastic surgeon, or the, uh, or the dermatologist. Now, I know that we, uh, we were trained by, uh, by somebody named uh, Lou Catania, Dr. Lou Catania. And Lou Catania always said, lumps and bumps belong in jars, not in faces. So with that, thank you so much. Hold on, uh, hold on a second, Joe. I got my mic back on. So Andy, Mark, don't run away here real quick. I, I went through my phone as you guys were talking and came up with a few pictures here that I want to kind of echo what you guys were talking about, and then we'll get into the housekeeping. So I have an Oklahoma license, and they teach you know the Elman unit and surgical removal. And one of the things I learned was when things grow out and not down, uh, that, you know, it's likelihood that it's not cancer because cancer has, you know, enzymes that eat down. So like, Mark, what was your common saying here? Common things, we, we, we respond yeah, to common, common treatments? On the common treatment. So if you, just like the example I made with blepharitis, if you think it's a common diagnosis and you use the standard of care, most oftentimes it responds to common treatment. So like this one here, this guy has a, this came out of my phone here. So this guy has an ectropion. He looks like he's got this lesion down here. 
So, you know, is this, do I need to send this to a dermatologist? He's got some type of skin issue going on down here. So I just throw a little bit of steroid on it. And you can see we released this inflammation and his eye, eyelid returns back up. So cancer is not going to respond to that common steroid as you're alluding to. Same thing here, Mark, is what you're saying is that you're just trying to give some examples. Here's a lady that comes in and you see this lesion right here. And man, is this, you know, is this oh, basal Greg, hold cells? on, hold on. You, you need to share your screen. Did I unshare? Because I, I was, I, I did, I, I was, I thought I was missing something. So how about I stop sharing? We were panicking, checking in the chat. I think right. the images were All in right. the chat. So I'll go back here. I'll go real quick. Let me go, everyone. Yeah. Joe, is it showing up now? Yes, it is. Yes. All right. So here it is. This was the part about growing. Yeah, you know, this is just like a little Veruca or something. There's no right. cancer here because it's not growing down. Here's the guy that's showing with the ectropia on here now. And you see this little lesion is this cancer. You see the skin problems, yep. but it replies, you know, responds to steroids pretty quickly. That's your common therapy, Mark, that you're, the, yep. that you're talking about. That's yep. I'm just enhancing and echoing what you're saying here. Yep. Here's a lady here that comes in and, you know, you see this lesion in here at the nose and you're like, well, it's in that common area where the UV hits. Is this a basal cell? But she starts to respond to that common therapy that you're talking about, a steroid. Yep. Kept digging in. And again, here's a person that comes in and, you know, coming in for an eye exam and they, they you know, hasn't been in for a couple of years. They keep missing this at the primary care doc. Or I said to this guy right here, what the heck is this thing going on in your ear? Or what's this thing going on on your nose here on this person? So just basically echoing what you're saying. These None of these responded to any common therapies out there. Been there for a while, non-healing. We as op optometrists just supporting what you're saying here. I just dug all these out of my phone while you were doing your lecture there. So, um, cool. so that's right. it. So I'll, I'll now say thank you for do to doing this CE periocular malignancies, Dr. Gerwood and Myers, you guys did a great job. We knew you would love having you. Joe, anything you want to say before we wrap up the CE and do some housekeeping? No, just to thank our, our presenters again. It, it's very pertinent information. It, it, it could be life-saving information, uh, information, and it was, it was done in a very interesting and engaging way. So we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Hopefully everyone stays well and everybody in the audience, thanks for attending. And that ends the CE, so thank you. And we'll just do a little bit of housekeeping here.